Today we're going to talk about another type of loop called a for loop and it's often called a counting loop because it allows us to execute a loop a specified number of times. So as I said we're going to talk about for loops and then we're going to talk about what type of loop you should choose for your program because we've already talked about while loops and do while loops so you're going to have three choices of loops and it turns out you can use any one of them in your program so it's kind of a matter of style as to which one to use. Let's first try to motivate why we might want to use a for loop. So um, we often want to repeat a loop a fixed number of times. As an example I might want to sum the numbers from 1 to n where n is a number input by the user. So they might say sum the numbers from 1 to 10 or I want the sum of numbers from 1 to 30. As another example you might want to know how much interest you would earn on a certificate of deposit that you have for 10 years and for each of the 10 years you'd like the program to print out how much interest you would earn for that particular year. So here's an actual example of some code that sums numbers from uh, 1 to n. So it starts out and we just initialize some variables including uh, our sum and then we're going to enter the number we should sum to and read that into n. And that brings us to the star of our um, code which is our for loop and you can see that it is adding i to sum and you can see these there's three statements here. There's one that we call the initialization statement that sets i to be zero initially. There's our Boolean expression for determining whether we want to continue executing this loop another time and it's while i is less than or equal to n. And finally there's what's called the loop increment which allows us to make progress toward terminating the loop. And in this case uh, we increment i by 1. And this loop increment is done after the loop body executes but before the next check of the Boolean expression. So uh, as a simple example here let's uh, actually insert a table into our program here and let's ask for let's see we'll have three rows two columns each we'll label one of them n we'll have i we'll have sum it's all a little bit smaller so we can fit things in. So we can't drop it down in here. Okay, so let's say we'll start with something small. Let's say we just um, initially notice we have n is actually here. We've declared n. It's a question mark. We don't know what its value is. Then here we've set i to be 0 and sum to be 0. And just for grins, I'm going to not initialize i, so we're going to leave it uninitialized. Now we ask the user for a number to sum to, and I'm going to make it kind of short, so I'll make it be 3. So we're going to sum the numbers 1, 2, and 3. And now we're going to do our for loop. So we start and we execute the initialization statement which sets i to be 0. So i gets set to 0. Now we check to see whether we should execute the loop body and i is less than n because 0 is less than 3. So we execute the loop body. Remember we're using the shorthand for adding a number to a variable. So in this case we're adding i to the current value of sum. So sum is 0 and when we add i to it it is still 0. So now we 
come back to we increment i by 1 and that sets i to be equal to 1 because 0 plus 1 is 1 and now come to the top of the loop and we evaluate the conditional 1 is still less than or equal to 3 so again we execute this uh, addition statement and now we add 1 to sum and we update sum to be 1 now we execute this loop increment statement at the end and that's going to increment i to be 2 we come to the top of the loop and execute this uh, boolean expression 2 is less than or equal to 3 so that's true we're going to execute the loop body again so sum uh, is plus equal i, i is 2, sum is 1, so 2 plus 1 is 3. Again, we now increment our loop counter, or loop variable, so i becomes 3. And I just called it a loop variable because we often call the variable that's getting incremented our loop variable or our counting variable because it's counting up. At any rate, we now evaluate the expression, and 3 is less than or equal to 3. That's true. So one more time, we evaluate the addition, and we add, in this case, 3 to sum because i is equal to 3, so sum becomes 6. And we now increment i, and i becomes 4. So 4 is not less than or equal to 3, and so we'd exit our loop, come down here and execute our Cout statement, and we would say that the sum of the numbers from 1 to 3 is 6. So that's our example of a for loop. So just looking at the details, you can see again the three elements, the initialization, the Boolean expression to check what should be, uh, whether the loop body should be executed again, the update statement that's executed after the loop body uh, completes, then our statements, our loop body, and again, like a while loop, they're enclosed in curly braces so that they're delimited and the compiler knows where our uh, loop body begins and ends. So the initialization part, this part right, whoops, this part right here, is supposed to initialize what we call the loop variables or the counter variable that's going to be used in the loop. So in this case, it was i. So n is not really considered a loop variable. It's the number of times we want the loop to execute. The loop variable is our counting variable. It's the variable that we're going to use to count either up or down toward um, our final uh, number of times that we want to count. Then this update part, again, is executed at the end of the loop body. It assigns a new value, so assigns a new value to the loop variable and allows us to make progress toward terminating the loop so that we don't get into an infinite loop. So looking at the flow of control as a visual flow chart and kind of mapping the elements, the initialization, the Boolean expression, the update into the flow chart, we see that the initialization statement, which in this case is i equals zero, that that comes before our loop. And therefore, it executes exactly once. Remember when I was going through the counting or summing of the numbers, I only assigned 0 to i once, and that was before I ever executed the loop. Next comes the uh, Boolean decision about whether we're going to proceed, and if it's true, we execute the statements in the loop body, and then when we've executed the statements in the loop body, we execute the update statements. So they come at the very end of the loop body, but before we do the next check. 
So if you wanted to compare a loop versus a, or a, a um, for loop versus a while loop, you can see the comparable forms here. So in a for loop, here we're summing the numbers from uh, 1 to n. And this time I was a little more clever. I actually set my loop variable to 1 before I had set it to 0. And there was really no reason to start at 0. I should have started at 1. And up in the while loop, I do that before the while loop ever starts. Then in the while loop, I say while well, n is less than or equal 10, here's that same statement in the for loop. Then both loops add n to sum. And this is another way of doing it. You could also say sum plus equals n. In the while loop, I increment n at the end of my loop body. Here in the for loop, I also increment m, but it's done up between the parentheses that you see uh, right here. And you may say, a lot of you are going to think that the while loop is more intuitive, and perhaps it is, but as you get more experience, you'll find that the for loop is nice because it's more compact. It's actually like a shorthand statement. And we find actually that while initially you're going to tend to use, want to use while loops, as you become more experienced, you'll often find yourself using for loops when while loops might be more appropriate. Here's another way of looking at the equivalence between for and while loops. At the top of the screen, we have the for loop, at the bottom, the while loop. And I'm just matching the parts of the for loop to parts of the while loop. So you can see that the initialization statement for a for loop comes before we would do anything in the while loop. So it would become before the loop. Then the Boolean expression for the for loop is what um, guards the while loop. And then the update statement in the for loop is executed at the end of the while loop, just like it's also executed at the end of the for loop. So let's work through another example with uh, for loops. Let's try to calculate the value of x to the y's power. So for example, 2 to the 4th power is 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. We have to multiply 2 by itself 4 times. And that's perfect for a uh, for loop. Basically, we're just going to execute the for loop the number of times uh, we want to exponentiate. And that is y. We want to do it y times because it's x to the y power. So if it was x to the 10th power, we'd want to do it 10 times, multiply x by itself 10 times. So here's our program. And while this is the main event, let me just explain the code. We're raising x to the y power. So we have declarations here for x and y then number of multiplications is going to be our loop variable. That's going to be what we use to count up to y. And we have to initialize our product, which is going to be the eventual result, which is 16. Okay, so we ask the user for values for x and y, and then read in those values of x and y. And now here's our for loop for raising x to the y power. And we're going to want to multiply basically x by itself a certain number of times. And we're going to do that by having number of multiplications count its way up until it's equal to y. So initially we'll start with the number of multiplications being 0. We'll continue while it's less than y. And then we will increment number of multiplications once or by one at the end of each loop. You might think, wait a minute, why am I not doing x times equal x? And the reason is that would keep changing x on us. If x started at 2, the first time it would be uh, multiplying x by 2 and giving us 4. But then x would be 4, 
and multiplying it by 4 would give us 16. The next time x would be 16 and multiplying x by itself would give us 256. So actually we have to keep the product in a separate variable and then keep multiplying that product by x. So again, let's just check out what would happen uh, here if we were to trace the execution of this for loop. So let's uh, create a table. And it's going to have four rows this time. So we'll have x and y, the product, and the number of multiplications. And because it's so big, I'm going to abbreviate it as nummult so I can get it to fit easily on the screen. Didn't like that. Let's undo that. And move it over here. Okay. So Let's say that we've read in a value of 2 for x and 4 for y. And this product here was set product to 1. And this number of multiplications assignment set number mult to 0. Again, remember this variable here should be number of multiplications. I'm just abbreviating it so it fits on the screen. And the CN is what set the X and the Y to 2 and 4. So now I start out and the first thing I do is execute my initialization statement which sets number of multiplications to 0 and that's redundant. It was already 0 because of this initialization statement right here. But if I had forgotten, if I had not initialized it to zero, then this would have been a big question mark. And now this statement would have been necessary. It would have set number of multiplications to zero. So now number of multiplications is less than y. We do that check in. It's zero is less than four. So we multiply our product by x. x is two and our product is one. So one times two gives us two. And now Having executed the loop body, we increment the number of multiplications by 1. And we do our comparison. 1 is less than 4. So we again execute our loop body. Multiply the product by x. The product is 2. x is 2. 2 times 2 is 4. So we assign 4 to product. We finished the loop body, so we increment the number of multiplications again by 1, it becomes 2. And do our comparison. 2 is still less than 4, so we now uh, again execute our loop body, multiplying product by x. Product is 4 and x is 2, so product becomes 8. And again, we are done with our loop body, so we increment the number of multiplications by 1, so it goes from 2 to 3. Execute our conditional check. 3 is less than 4, so we again multiply the product by uh, 2, the value of x, so product is 8 and x is 2, so 8 times 2 is 16 and product becomes 16. We're done with our loop body, so we uh, do the update statement, increment numMult, it goes from 3 to 4, and now the number of multiplications is 4, y is 4, the statement is false because 4 is not less than 4, we drop out of the loop and execute our cout statement and print the result of, and x is 2, so the result of 2 
raised to the power y is 4 is the product 16. So if we were to look at what this actually prints, it would print the result of 2 raised to the power 4 is 16. And we're going to skip this next slide. If you want, as an exercise, you can try to do it yourself, but we will also work through this exercise in class. And we will also work through this exercise in class. Okay, so what type of loop do you want to use in uh, your program? Should you use a while loop? Should you use a for loop? Should you use a do while loop? Well, any of them actually work. I guess a do while loop doesn't always work if you want to ensure that the loop body uh, can optionally execute zero times. But uh, while loops and for loops are interchangeable in that they both work, but just like a sledgehammer and a hammer can both drive a nail into a piece of wood, sometimes the hammer is the better tool. Whereas if you're trying to drive, say, a big stake into the ground, probably the sledgehammer would be better. So it's the same thing. Uh, you could drive a nail into a piece of wood with a sledgehammer. You could, with effort, drive a stake into a ground with a hammer but it's good to write, use the right tool. So for loops tend to be the right tool when you know in advance how many loop iterations you want to perform and then you can simply count the number of iterations and as I described earlier we often call a for loop a counting loop. So for example if I want to sum the numbers from 1 to n that's good for a for loop. And you might say, well, what if it's n? I don't know in advance what n is. Well, you do if you've prompted the user for the value of n and then read the value into n. So even if when you write the program, you're not sure what the value of n is, at runtime, you will know what that value is before you start the for loop. And therefore, it is a fixed number of iterations. Okay, here's another example where I first read the number of employees. So I say, how many employees do you have? And you say 253. So then I know exactly how many employees there are. I can use a for loop to um, read each employee's salary and say calculate their pension contribution. Now another example that we'll go through uh, in the next lecture is when a numeric computation is, vol is involved, such as, um, well, we'll give you an example in a moment. So just put this in the back of your mind that sometimes when numeric uh, computations are involved, we'll also want to use a for loop. So a while and a do while are most useful when you have to take an action in the loop body to determine whether another iteration is necessary. So for example, in our miles per gallon computation, we asked the user to enter a new miles driven and gallons consumed, and we exited the loop if the user entered zero for miles driven. So we didn't know in advance how many times the user wanted to execute the loop. In fact, the user may not have known until they were done with their calculations and they entered a zero. As another example, let's say that I'm trying to guess the number chosen by a user and exit if the number is correct. Let's say the, I say choose a number between 0 and 20 and I start guessing. And you might say, well, I'm just going to count up from 0 but to 20. And that certainly would work. But let's say I modified it and said, so guess the number chosen by a user and the user has to tell me whether I'm too high or too low. So let's say the user chooses 17 and I guess 10 and the user says well you're too low now I would guess a number between 10 and 20 and probably I'd guess 15 because that's halfway between 10 and 20 
And the user would say, well, you're still too low because their number is 17. So now I'd know the number was between 16 and 20. I might next guess 18. And the user would say you're too low, or I'm sorry, too high. So now I'd know the number had to be 17. So this is an example where if I'm clever, I don't need to use a for loop. I could use a while loop, and each time through, I kind of have the range of numbers I'm looking at. So that's an action I take inside the loop. And then we use a do while if we know that the loop will have to have at least one iteration. Otherwise, we use a while. And in general, you see us using while statements in our programs. So let's just look at a couple examples and see which might be best. The first one is summing a series of numbers, and that's best for a for loop. That's actually a numeric computation. So even if I wasn't sure how many numbers to do in the sequence, I would tend to use a for loop for it. And we'll talk in the next lecture about what to do if I didn't know how many numbers might be in the sequence. Okay, if let's say I want to read in the number of days of sick leave taken by employees in the department. So perhaps I want to uh, sum the number of sick days, but I don't know how many employees are in the department. But I know the user will enter a negative number when they're ready to exit. So in this case, I'd need to use a while loop because I don't know in advance how many uh, times the loop should execute. Instead, there's an action I take in the loop, which is to read the next employee sick leave number, and then I'll check to see if it's negative. So number two, the answer is a while loop. And then reading in the list of exam scores for one student when the number of exam scores is known in advance. And in this case, I use a while, or I, sorry, I use a for loop because the number of exam scores is known in advance. So I could write a loop for, said basically for one, for i equals say one up to the number of exam scores. And by the way, going back to two for a moment, you might have been wondering, well, why didn't he use a do while loop? What if for some reason there were no employees in the department? I know that's kind of iffy. So you could argue me into saying it should be a do while loop if you claim, well, the number of employees in a department has to be at least one. In that case, I could have used a do while loop but a while loop would work here just as well.